Okay, so we're talking about integration right now because we're in the second half of our course. And the second half of our course deals with integral calculus. And of course, with integral calculus, we also have antiderivatives. They're essentially the same thing. And the moral of the story is essentially if we're doing integration right now, we only have just a handful of things we can integrate. Namely, powers of x, x to the a, we can integrate that, that's 1 over a plus 1, x to a plus 1. We can integrate cosine, we get sine. We can integrate sine, we get negative cosine. We can integrate secant squared, we get tangent. We can integrate secant times tangent, we get secant. We can integ even integrate 1 over 1 plus x squared, which gives us arctangent. And we can't quite really integrate the square root of 1 minus x squared, but we can do a definite integral for square root of 1 minus x squared because we know what this looks like. This is part of a circle, and so we can actually find the definite integral, say, from 0 to 1, or from negative 1 to 1, very similar, pi fours. That's pretty much it. That's all we can do right now. Now, in the next quarter, you'll learn some more functions, and of course, learning more functions gives you more, more fun things to do. And we can also do lots of stuff with our integrals before we actually integrate it. So we can manipulate them, use trigonometric identities. Uh, we'll see an example of that later today. Uh, do some algebra where we expand, multiply by conjugates, all sorts of fun stuff. Always our goal is to simplify, simplify until we get something here. And the other big thing you can do is the substitution rule. Substitution is a really important technique in integration. So if you want to become great at integration, it's a good thing to become good at substitution rule. Now why do we do integration at all? Is it useful? So the last few lectures, starting last week, going through today and and tomorrow are the applications of integration. And we're not going to cover all the applications of integration. We're only going to cover some of them, but we're going to cover a lot of the important ones. So one application is cumulative change. Now that says, suppose I know how the function f is changing. So I know the, the rate at which f is changing. In other words, I know f prime. So I know f prime. I know this rate. And I want to say, well, how much did f change in two time periods from a to b? Well, very simple. I just integrate a to b f prime of t dt, and that's by the fundamental theorem of calculus, it's f of b minus f of a. Now, of course, the way to always think about any integration problem is you say, well, here's what I'll do. I'm going to just cut it up into little tiny pieces and understand the little tiny pieces and then add them up. That's what every integration does. So in this case, the f prime of t dt, this is how much you change at time t. f prime of t is the rate of change dt is your length of time that you're changing, so f prime of t dt is the change you make at time t. And then you just add it up. So every time I'm going to write an integral sign, I'm basically going to say I'm going to add it up. That's what integration is. It's adding stuff up. So I'd find the total change. Now what about another application? Well, another application of integration is area. So suppose I have two functions, f and g. f is larger than g between a and b. And so my picture is I have f on top, I have g on the bottom, I, and I'm going from a to b, so I have this area here. I'm trying to find that area. Very easy. I integrate from a to b f of x minus g of x to dx. And what's the idea, the intuition? Well, f of x minus g of x is like a height. I'm thinking of taking a small sliver, a tiny thin rectangle. And I say, well, what's the area of this rectangle? Well, the height is the difference between the functions, f of x minus g of x. The width is the difference in the x values, so the width is dx. So f of x minus g of x dx is basically the area of a small slice. And if I want to find the total area, I add them up. In other words, remember this is basically top minus the bottom. All right. Well, close related to area, of course, is, is volume. How do we take volume? So we have some three-dimensional object. Now, will tend to stay fairly simple, but you know we, this works for any three-dimensional object. So we, we're in three-dimensional space, and I'm reaching the limit of my drawing abilities here. So I have some blob. And the way I'm going to think about finding the volume of this blob is, again, same thing as area. I slice into little tiny pieces. So I'm slicing into little tiny pieces. And so what happens is I essentially get a very thin piece but of something which roughly has, well, if I were to turn it on its side, so I have some thin piece here with essentially the same height all the way around. It looks like a lot like a squash cylinder. And I say, well, what's the volume of this thin piece? Well, the volume of that thin piece is whatever the area is on the top times whatever the width or the height. 
So the volume of this little thin slice is A of y dy. So that's the volume of one thin slice. How do I find the volume of the whole thing? I add it up from A to B. See, there's a trend going on. Uh, I should also say you can do length with integrals, but that's not something we'll deal with in our class, so that you can do that. Very similar procedure. Now, what are some other things we can do? Well, one thing we saw was density, in particular, like a linear density. Suppose I have a rod. Now, this rod is made out of metal, but the metal isn't the same metal throughout. Maybe they, they sort of have different mixtures. And, and so, of course, different mixture of metal at different parts of the rod makes it, some parts of the rod heavier, more dense. And suppose I know what the density is at every point on the rod. So I have this function rho. Rho is the density. I don't know why, why you would spell rho, sorry, spell density with a rho, but okay, that's what they do. All right, so rho is the density at x. So I say, well, look, I'm just going to take a little tiny slice here. So I take my little tiny slice, and I say, well, I know how heavy that piece is. I say, that piece is rho, which is the density, times the length of it. So rho of x dx is the weight of a little tiny slice. So I want to find the weight of the whole thing? I add them up. And now we're on to the last thing we talked about, which we didn't finish yet, which was radial density. An example of this is population, where you'll see, for example, in cities, where are the skyscrapers? Well, they're all in the middle. And as you get further and further out, you get the skyscrapers get smaller and smaller and smaller. And the idea being, well, if you're in a big city, people want to be in the center of the city. As you get further from the city, people want to spread out a little bit, so that the density changes depending upon your length from the city, center of the city. All right. So what I have is I have a, a density, rho of r. Uh, I'll use lowercase r here. This is the density from the center. So depending upon how far r is your measurement from how far you are from the center, that's your density at that point. So in particular, if I look around any single circle, my density is the same. So suppose I know my density. So in other words, my population, maybe my density is measuring things like uh, number of people per square mile. All right, and I know how many people there are per square mile, and it varies depending on where I'm at in the city. And I might ask, okay, so well, what's the total density from zero miles out to some number of miles out here. Well, what am I going to do? I'm going to do the exact same thing as I did before. I'm going to break it up into little tiny pieces, where in each piece, I know exactly what the density times, well, I should say, I know exactly what the population is in that little piece. Then I'm going to add them up. No big surprises. Let me draw a bigger picture here. So we have our city center, and essentially, as we move out away, our density is changing. OK. So I have to decide how to chop stuff up. Now, there's lots of ways to chop stuff up. Now, one thing you could say, well, why, why don't I just chop things up like this? What's wrong with this picture? Well, there's nothing wrong with chopping stuff up like that. But the problem here with this way of chopping up is you say, OK, I can find the area of this little rectangle, but What's the right density to associate with that? Because as I move up and down, I go from being very, very loosely populated, not very dense, to being very, very dense, because I'm getting closer to the actual city center. But then I go back to being less populated, less dense. So in some sense, my density, if I were to, to break it up like this, it, it varies a lot as I move up and down this little rectangle. So this rectangle is probably not the best way to break it up. What I want to do is I want to break it up into something where it essentially has the same density in the whole small subregion I'm breaking it up into. Now, thinking about my definition of density, it's radial density. How far am I from the center? And so I say to myself, OK, so what I'm going to do is instead of breaking up, all right, let me, instead of using a red pen that doesn't work, let's use a red pen that does work. Ah, oh, there we go, OK. So instead of breaking up into little rectangles, I'll break it up into these little sort of annuli. This is how I'll break it up. And now, because my density is based on how far away I am, 
essentially, in the whole annuli, I'm the same distance away. I'm distance, let's just say, r away from the center. So this makes a lot of sense for chopping stuff up, because I have good control for what my density looks like. In fact, on this small region here, my density is just simply rho of r. As soon as I know how far away I am, I know my density on the whole thing. Now, I have to stop and think about it, and I say, OK, how do I find my density? Well, my density, sorry, uh, how do I find my density? How do I find my population? The population is, of course, my density times my area. Now, my density, I know. That's rho of r. Because on that whole thin strip, it's essentially the same density. It's, it's just wherever rho tells me it is, rho of r. I have to figure out what my area is. Now, my area here, I say, well, it kind of looks like a, a thin circle, and then you just you know, puff it out a little bit. And I say, well, how can I figure out this area? Well, I think about it and say, well, I'm going to say that the width of this strip here, this strip has width just a small change in r, dr. And to figure out what the area inside this strip is, pull out my scissors, do a cut, and then I just take my area here, instead of thinking of it as a circle, I just pull it, use my awesome strength, and lay it flat. And when I do that, I see that roughly that circle becomes a nice little rectangle. What's the height? dr. What's this length? Circumference. What's the area? Well, well, first off, what's the circumference? Circumference is 2 pi r. Ah, whoops, got my 2 pi here. So what's the area? Well, the area is 2 pi r dr. So this is a slightly different way than when I tried to do last time. Hopefully this is more intuitive for people. So in other words, this strip here is just the same as this strip, just laid flat. OK? So that's my population inside this little tiny piece. So how do I find my total population? I add them up. Yeah, see, same thing. I always just, once I know what's happening in a little tiny piece, I add up all the pieces together. So the total population will be the integral from a to b, this function, 2 pi r rho r dr. Okay, so we had a very specific example. Here we said, well, suppose the density behaves like 5 times 1 plus r squared to the minus half. Now, if you look at that, that says essentially at r equals 0, your density is 5 and you're going down. And then there are units here. I think this is 1,000 people per square mile. Sorry, it's a kind of small scale. 1,000 people per, per square mile. And I said, OK, find the total population within 10 miles. So I have this city. It's a big city. It goes out 10 miles. What's the total population within that 10-mile range? So now it's very simple because we have this formula. So I want to go from somewhere to somewhere 2 pi r. Then I put in rho of r, 5 times 1 plus r squared minus a half dr. Now, what are the bounds going to be? 0 to 10. Because I want it to be within 10 miles. So within 10 miles means I start at the city center 0, and I just keep going until I hit 10 miles out. And I discovered yesterday, or I should say on Monday, that I'm getting really bad at my arithmetic as the further I go. So I'm going to try not to make any arithmetic mistakes. I know on Monday, at one point, I had 2 plus 8, and then I did 2 times 8. Ugh, how embarrassing. But don't worry, you don't lose a point for that on the, on the final. So you should, you should try to avoid those kinds of mistakes. But now mine is permanently on YouTube, including this confession. Oh, dear. <laughs> OK, so what can we do? Well. 2 pi and 5 are constants. So those come out. So I'm just going to pull them out right away. So I count in front. 
10 pi. Now, how are we going to integrate r times 1 plus r squared to the minus a half? Seems kind of strange. Any ideas? Substitution. Now, what about this problem tells us substitution? Well, one thing tells us it's not on this up part up here. If it's not up here, then we have to do something. But there's something about this problem that says substitution. And the thing about this problem that says substitution is I have a function 1 plus r squared inside a function to the negative half power. Whenever you see a function in a function, you might see in the back of your mind, maybe there's some substitution involved here. Now, oftentimes you can sort of mentally check. You say, okay, I see a function in a function, so if I were to try substitution, I would guess that inside piece. And you say, okay, if I guess the inside piece, what would the du be? Well, it would be 2r dr. Now, we can all do this mentally, hopefully. And then you just check. The 2 isn't important. Constants, you can always you know, move around. But you say, do I have an r dr floating around somewhere? Oh, we got lucky. Right there. Oh, thank you. OK. The substitution gods have smiled on us. So we can do substitution. In fact, what happens is, well, this 2r dr, I'll rewrite this. So a half du is r dr. So that this becomes u to the minus a half. And r dr becomes 1 half. And 1 half comes out du. OK, now that's an easy integral. But we should also change our bounds because this is a definite integral. Now, our old bounds were from 0 to 10. Where will the new bounds go between? Well, when r was 0 before, we plug it in here, what does u become? It becomes 1 because 1 plus 0 squared is 1. When r was 10 before, what does u become? 101, right? 1 plus 10 squared. So to figure out what your new bounds are, you plug your bounds into here and see what they become. OK, so half times 10 pi, well, that's 5 pi. And then the integral of u to the minus a half, well, you add 1 to the exponent, so it becomes u to the 1 half. And then what do you do? You divide by a half, or in this case, the same as multiplying by 2. Then you evaluate from 1 to 101. So this becomes 10 pi times 101 to the 1 half, which is square root of 101, minus 1 to the 1 half, or square root of 1, which is simply 1. There we go. Now, of course, we can get an estimate. What is square root of 101 roughly? It's close to 10, right? 101 is close to 100. So roughly, this is 10. So 10 minus 1 is 9. So this is 90 pi. Pi is 3 point something. So that's probably close to. 300, give or take. And then that's 300,000 people, so roughly 300,000 people. That's just an estimate. Of course, calculators are, are much better. OK, so now we can do density. Now, after all that, good news, no density on the final. But it's good to see it. No. Because when you go home during your spring break and your parents ask, so what is all this calculus stuff good for? You can pull out the density stuff and say, oh, look, you can do all this cool stuff. You can do area volume, but you can also do density. And they're like, ooh, density, that sounds cool. So it's good to learn. All right. So I don't want you to worry too much about the density. If you're confused about it, it's OK. But if you like it, you know, you can study it. Don't, just because it's not in the final doesn't mean you shouldn't learn it. You know, it's, it's good to learn it. OK. Now, let's go back. Oh, not ready for that yet. Let's talk about one other thing. So suppose I want to find the average. Now, of course, whenever we take tests, people always ask, what was the average? Well, it's very easy. Because, you know, we have so many students in our class. To find the average, we add up all the test scores, and we divide by how many people there are. There's our average. It makes it easy because there's, you know, just finitely many people, I just have to add a finitely many scores. But what if instead of having a finitely many scores, I have this function? 
A to B. And I ask, well, what is the average? of the function f of x for a less or equal to x less or equal to b. I can ask that question too. But now it seems kind of strange because, well, okay, how do you find the average? Well, we did it before when we were talking about average for the test. Well, we add up all the scores. Remember how many people there are. But how many points are there here between a and b? There's a lot. In fact, infinitely many points. So I can't just add up all the points from A to B and divide by the number of points between A and B. Hmm. So what can I do? Well, instead of trying to think about adding them all up, I can say, well, here's what I'll think of doing. I'll sample. Now, this is what statisticians do when they go out and they want to find out what do people think. They want to take a survey of America. Now, they don't go out when they do these surveys and ask every single American, how do you feel about puppies? No. Though what they do is they just pick out some small sample, maybe a few hundred people, and they ask what their opinions are about puppies. And then they say, OK, well, based upon what these people said, we can extrapolate. And we know what the majority of people think. So they don't have to ask everybody. They just have to look at just a small group. So what we're going to do is we're going to say, well, let's suppose Instead of looking at all the points from A to B, let's just pick n of them equally spaced. And I'm going to say, well, what if I just look at the average of the function on those n points? Now, roughly speaking, that should be what the average is for the function. Intuitively, that's what should happen. OK, well, how do we find it? Well, so to find the average, we divide by how many points we took, which is 1 over n. And because we took n equally spaced points, well, if I think of, so let's say, delta x is the width between two points, it's really like b minus a over n, then what I'm doing is I'm really adding up from i equals 1 to n of my function evaluated at a plus i delta x. You know, I start at you know, the first point, then I go to the second point, would be a plus delta, go to the next point, would be a plus 2 delta, so forth and so on. Okay. So this is a pretty good approximation to the average. I just sample at some points. Now, to find the true average, we say, well, look, the true average will be a limit as n goes to infinity because we're doing a better, better sample. We're surveying more people. The more people you survey, you know, the, the lower your uh, error rate is. Because you, know, you always see these polls within plus or minus so many percent. And it's really fun when you see like politicians, uh, when they have these voting, and you see like a politician got 2% of the votes, and then plus or minus 3%. Hmm. They probably didn't do very well. OK. Now, this should look really, really familiar. Have we seen anything that looks like this before? Rhymes with Hemon. Riemann. Yeah, this looks like a Riemann sum. Almost. Not quite. We saw this part before, but what else did a Riemann sum have? It really had. Let me move this into the inside. This part isn't quite what, what should be there. What should be here is delta x to be a Riemann sum. Well, how do I make it a delta x? Well, the delta x is really just the length of one of these intervals. So if I were able to put a b minus a here, then this would be my delta x, and I'd have a Riemann sum inside. But I can't just willy-nilly put a b minus a there. I have to compensate for it. OK, no problem. I'll put a b minus a over here on the outside. So now it's the same sum as before, but now I say, aha, this is a Riemann sum. And what happens as this goes to infinity? It becomes the integral between the two points. So this is the average. This is what we're going to find the average of the function to be. So 
if I want to find the average of a function between two points, a to b, well, it's very simple. I integrate from a to b, whatever the function is, and I divide by the length of the interval. Okay? All right. So that's how we can use the integral. We can use the integral to find the average. Now, there's another geometrical interpretation of average. If I come back to my picture here, the geometrical interpretation, once I see that this is what I'm defining as average, this is a number that comes out of this function here. And I say to myself, OK, what does that number represent? Well, that number basically represents the following. It represents the height of a rectangle. So that if I look at a rectangle which has the same base, but has this value, we'll call it f sub average. So just notation-wise, this f the average value. So what it is is that the area of this rectangle, which has the average height, if I were to look at it, is equal to the area underneath the curve from A to B. So that's another way to do the interpretation. So what rectangle with the same base has the exact same area as the area underneath the curve? Now, of course, this integral, because our function can be negative, can actually go down below the x-axis. So our average could be a negative value, and our average could be 0. That's perfectly fine. All right. So here's an example. Suppose I want to find the average value of the function f of x between 1 and 4. Oh, f of x that equals x squared. Let's say what the function is, because it really depends on the function. So what do we do? Well, we just plug it into the formula. 1 and 4 correspond to a and b. So it's 1 over b minus a, integral a to b, f of x, dx. So there's nothing really new going on here. It's just a new interpretation of what we can do with the integral. So these are just like integrals we've done before. In fact, this is a very specific integral that we've done a few times. So I have 1 third here. Integral of x squared is 1 third x cubed, and I evaluate from 1 to 4. So this is, if you like, 1 ninth. Then I take x cubed, which is 4 cubed, subtract 1 cubed. So I evaluate at x equals 4, subtract, evaluate at x equals 1. Now 4 cubed is 64. 1 cubed is 1. 64 minus 1 is 63. And 1 ninth of 63 is 7. So what we have here is we have this curve, y equals x squared, from 1 to 4. And the height, I'm sorry, excuse me, the average value is 7. So if you look at the top of the curve, here's 16. The bottom, here's 1. And somewhere in between 7. Okay, so that's the average height. Right? More or less. Now, one observation. Notice here, on my average height, I actually have a point on the curve when I'm at exactly the average height. Let's see if we can figure out what that point is. Well, this is the curve y equals x squared. And so to find it when it's average, I just take the curve x squared and set it equal to 7, because 7 is the average value. So I get x equals square root of 7. Now, I don't know where square root of 7 is, but I do know it's between 1 and 4. And it turns out we have a nice fact. And it's the following. If f of x is continuous on the interval a less than or equal to x less than or equal to b, then there is a point C, where C is between A and B, so that the value at C is equal to 1 over B minus A, integral A to B of F of X dx. In other words, the average. So if I have a continuous function, and I look at what the average value is between A and B, which is this right here. This is the average value. 
there is some point that meets average, or sometimes, or in other words, at some point we are average. So there's, it's the same. Does this remind you of any theorem? Yeah. This is the mean value theorem. Mean value theorem says at some point you're average. Now, what's the proof? We don't need a proof because we've already proven it. This isn't just look like the mean value theorem. This is exactly the mean value theorem. Why? Well, let capital F of x be an antiderivative of little f of x. All right? Just any antiderivative you want. Now let's translate this sentence. F of c. What's another way to say f of c in terms of capital F? Yes, that's right, silence. <laughs> no, that's not right. F prime of c. C because f is the, capital F is the antiderivative of little f. So if I want to write little f, I just put f prime. So f prime of c, this is, I'm just translating this in b minus a is, well, still the same as b minus a. Now, according to the fundamental theorem of calculus, how do I find the integral from a to b of f of x dx? I take capital F of b minus capital F of a. And lo and behold, this statement here just translated using the antiderivative of a little f becomes this statement here. And this is the mean value theorem for derivatives. Because if I have a function which is continuous, the antiderivative is continuous and differentiable. So it's the exact same statement. And there are other ways to prove it, too. But we'll leave it at that. OK, so we can find average values. OK, now we need to go back to volume. I want to return to volume. OK, I should say, at this moment, we can now do nine of 10 questions on the final, which means that there's still one question left for us to do. You can also definitely do nine of 10 questions on every single one of the practice finals. Which still means there's one question left for us to do. And I want to go back, and I want to focus more on volume. So here, when I talked about volume before, we can take volume, and we basically just take the area of cross-sections. Finding the area of cross-sections, lo and behold, will give us the volume by just integrating those areas. So I want to do a very special case. Now, cross-sections in general can be any shape I want them to be. Circles, squares, rectangles, uh, anything you can imagine. And probably a lot of things you can't imagine. It always works. So I want us to take a very specific kind of thing. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take a region. I don't know what my region is. Something. I'm going to take some shape. And I'm going to take that shape, and I'm going to spin it around a line. Usually we'll spin it around the x-axis, but it doesn't have to be the x-axis. It can be any line. And what's going to happen is as I take the shape and spin it around, it's going to sort of sweep out a three-dimensional shape. It's a lot like a lathe. I don't know if any of you have done any woodworking where we form a three-dimensional shape. So now let's see how badly I can do this shape here. OK, and then we come in, and something like that. So I spin the shape around. And as I spin this shape around, it sweeps out this nice three-dimensional figure. Oops. OK. All right, so hopefully we can all at least imagine, start with this, and I just spin it around. And what happens is I form this three-dimensional shape, this three-dimensional volume. So my question is, how do I find this volume? OK. Well, I'm going to do it the exact same way I already talked about over here. I do it by taking cross sections. And I know I'm going to split my volume up into little tiny pieces. 
So in this case, I'm imagining I'm just going to take a nice chop, split it in half. So when I take a chop and split it in half, there's another way to think about it. It's as if I'm just taking this little tiny piece here, this little tiny sliver of the region, and I spin it around. So what happens when I spin this around? Well, when I spin this around, I'm going to form a shape. OK. And that shape. Now you know I'm not an artist. I did take art class when I was in college. I had a great instructor. He came in the first day. He was from Africa. So I apologize. I'm not trying to offend anyone with my accent, but he had this really great line. He said, I do not believe you can all become good artists. But I do believe you can all become good draftsmen, you know, and, and uh, it's, it's like me. You know, I, I do not believe you can all become good mathematicians, but I do believe you can all become good calculators. And that's what you're learning. You're, you're becoming great calculators this quarter. Okay. So what happens here was when I spin this little piece around, it forms a little shape. And in particular, the shape, if I pull it out, looks like this. But it's not flat. There's a little bit of width. Okay. Roughly, it looks something like that. So that's my slice. So I'm going to find the volume by, of course, adding up all these slices. I mean, that's just one slice, and I just go all the way across, add them up. Now let's try to figure out what is the volume of this slice. Well, what kind of shape does this look like? It's like a circle. Or you could say a circle with a hole in it. It's almost a donut, but you know, it's, it's not very thick. It's a flat donut. This is also called an annulus, although maybe just a circle with a hole in it is better. Some people call these washers. If you've ever done any, any uh, work with machinery, you have these little washers made out of metal to help uh, do something. They're very useful, I'm sure. I don't, I don't know what they're useful for, but they're very useful. OK, so th how do you find it? Well, you think of it as a big circle. I'll use capital R. That's my big radius. And then you punch out a little circle. I'll use little r as my little radius. So that the area, well, that's very easy. I take pi big radius squared minus pi little radius squared. So that's the area. Now, how big is it? In other words, how high is it? Well. It's a small width change. Now, I didn't say what I'm integrating with respect to. I'm, so I'm going to put a, sort of a d dot. I'm, I'm going to be very vague about it. Maybe I'm integrating with respect to x, and then I'd say dx. Maybe I'm integrating with respect to y, dy. It's whatever the small change in whatever variable you're, you're integrating with respect to. Could be x, could be y. Could be something else. OK? I, I, I apologize. If you don't like the dot, just put x. All right, now, now that's the volume of one of my slices. So how do I find the total volume? I add them up, right. So what I do is I figure out where do I start, where do I end, and I add them all up. So the total volume is the integral from a to b. Now, notice I can factor out a pi here. Pi, big R squared minus little r squared, d, whatever I'm integrating with respect to. Or another way to think about this, to help you remember, integral from A to B, big R is the outer radius. In other words, it's the distance from where you're spinning around. This is where we're spinning around up to the very top. So this length is the outer radius, big R, minus the inner radius, the little r. So that's the distance from where we're spinning around from this line to the bottom squared. And then d whatever we're going to bring with respect to. Once you have this formula, then of course we can pretty much do anything we want. So in particular, let's do a special case. So suppose I'm going to take as my region, I'm going to have this curve y equals f of x. 
And then beneath it, I have y equals g of x. And I'm going to assume that f of x is greater than or equal to g of x, which is greater than or equal to 0. g of x could be 0. In other words, it could be the axis. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to spin it around the x-axis, where I take the region from x equals a out to x equals b. So this is the region I'm going to spin. And so that, you know, I'm forming this shape here. Something like that, OK? Well, now, according to my formula, well, what's the volume? Well, pi integral a to b. What's my outer radius? What's the top function? Well, it's, the, it's from the x-axis up to this line. So it's f of x squared minus the inner radius. Well, it's from the x-axis to this line, g of x squared. And then what am I integrating with respect to? I'm integrating with respect to x. Because essentially, the way I'm thinking of it is I'm, I'm taking my slices are in this direction. So I'm thinking of, of taking little slices this way. So I think it's taking small vertical things and spin them around. OK? That's it. That's our basic formula. Now let's try some examples. OK. How about we start with uh, something really easy? Let's do a sphere. Let's find the volume of a sphere. We've, we already found the volume of a sphere. And in your homework, you essentially find the volume of a sphere. In fact, you find something much more interesting. You find the volume of a, what's called the cross cap. Let's do a volume of a sphere today. Again, let's make sure we get the same answer. So how do you make a sphere? So how can you make a sphere by, by rotating a region roundabout? Yeah, the way you make a sphere is you start, let's say, with a semicircle, radius r. And you just start with the top half of the circle. You don't need the bottom half of the circle, because what you're going to do is you're going to take it now, and you're going to spin it. And what happens is, after you spin it, of course, you're going to fill in the bottom half. And now you're going to get this three-dimensional shape. You get a sphere out of it. OK. so. What do we normally say? We say x squared plus y squared equals r squared. So let's solve for what this function is here. That says y is the square root of r squared minus x squared. Just move x squared to the side, take the square root. Now usually we have plus or minus. The plus means you take the top half, minus the bottom half. And as we said, we only need the top half. So according to this, here's negative r, here's positive r, the volume will be pi integral from the bounds, negative r to r, because I'm starting from negative r, I'm going all the way up to r. My function, which is the square root of r squared minus x squared, squared. Now, what's the bottom? Well, in this case, the bottom is simply just the x-axis. So really, there's no bottom. So in this case, this is instead of dealing with the a, a, a a disk with a hole in the middle, an annulus, is actually just a whole disk. There's no, there's no hole. So in fact, it's, this is just 0 when we're doing solid regions like this. OK? All right, so that's just 0. Now, we look at this and say, uh-oh, there's an integral involving the square root of r squared minus x squared. I don't know if I can integrate that. Aha, but there's a little trick. We squared it, which means this is not a hard integral. This is a nice integral. Ah. Oh. Oh, yeah, that's the kind of integral I like. Polynomial. Woohoo! OK, now we're getting, we can feel it. We're almost there. What's the integral of r squared with respect to x? r squared x. Because r squared is a constant. So integral of constants, well, this, whatever that, that constant is times x. The integral of x squared? Yeah, 1 third x cubed. And then you evaluate from negative r to r. So you get pi. When you plug in r, you get r cubed minus 1 third r cubed. And we subtract. And again, there's a pi here. And then when you plug in negative r, you get r cubed plus 1 third r cubed. 
And now if you just clean it all up, you'll see that you get 4 thirds pi r cubed, which by now hopefully we know is the volume of a sphere. We've seen this at least once. And if you've taken geometry, you've seen that formula before as well. Okay, let's do one more really quick. So suppose now instead of just being a nice thing that we recognize, let's do something that we don't recognize. So suppose I take as my region, I spin it around, I'm going to take this graph, y equals sine x, and actually I'm going to go between 0 and sine x, where x goes between 0 and pi. So I need to specify my region. So I'm taking essentially just this part of the sine curve. This is going to be my region. And I'm going to spin it around. And of course when I spin it around, I get some sort of a three-dimensional shape. Kind of almost like a football. Something like that. What's the volume of this shape when I spin it around? So let's figure that out. Volume is pi integral from where to where? Yeah, 0 to pi. In fact, I said it right here. OK. We take our top function, which is the sine function, square, subtract the bottom function, which is 0 square, so that doesn't do anything, dx. So now we just have to integrate that. So how do we integrate sine squared x? Now, maybe some people are, are trying to say in their hearts, oh, I know this one, 1 third sine cubed x. Don't say that. I'd feel really bad. Uh, that's not right. It's nothing like what we've seen before. Now, we might say, OK, try u equals sine x. OK, that gets you somewhere, but you run into a problem. The derivative of sine is cosine. Do we have a cosine floating around anywhere? No. So to get the cosine, we'd get in trouble. So here is when your awesome trigonometry skills. Why did we learn all those trig identities? Because trig identities let us do these integrals. Sine squared is the same as 1 minus cosine 2x over 2. Those trig identities you thought you'd never be able to use anywhere again, they're all coming back now. Oh, we can do stuff like this. Oh, now we can integrate. Why? Because there's no, these are all simple functions. Now, first off, the half can come out in front. So I have a half pi. So this is a half pi. What's the integral of 1? Simply x. What's the integral of cosine 2x? So, so the integral of cosine, we know that one, because that's, oh, it's not over there. OK, I erased it. OK. If I hadn't erased it, we would know that the integral of cosine is sine. So the integral of, of cosine 2x is sine 2x. But I have to compensate for that 2x on the inside. And how do I do that? I divide by half. And then I have to evaluate. Ugh, I'm running out of space from 0 to pi. So when I evaluate, I get 1 half pi is still here in front times pi. And then what's sine of 2 pi? Sine 2 pi is 0. So pi minus 1 half times 0. And then subtract 1 half pi. I plug in 0 minus sine of 0. What's sine of 0? 0. OK, so I'm running out of space, but 0, 0, 0. So we are left with 1 half pi squared. Mmm, square pi. OK, that's it. We're done for today. We'll finish up last lecture on Friday. Woo! I have office hours this afternoon. Uh, otherwise, I'll see you Friday morning. <laughs>